Welcome from the deep. I am Mike Finder and today we're going to be doing something just a little bit differently. The other day I had a video pop up in my YouTube feed and it was titled what I watched in January and I absolutely loved that idea. So I thought I would sort of borrow that idea. I'm stealing their idea. But either way, I just wanted to run by what I've seen this month because I've seen some good stuff both old and new and I just wanted to talk about it a little bit. So the very first thing I watched this year was a movie called The Love Witch from 2016. This is directed by Anna Biller, and I was just completely blown away. Everything from the cinematography, to the lighting, to the acting, to the costumes, to the set design, the music, all of it is phenomenal. And I truly believe that this is one of those movies that every aspiring writer and director should see. There are not many films made like this anymore, and that is for a reason, because it's very hard to do, and especially nowadays, it's much more expensive than it was back in the day. This is a very 60s vibe to it, and and the story is extraordinarily compelling. The artwork had, had stuck out to me multiple times and it looked very cool, but I had always assumed it was an older movie just by the look of the poster. I ended up loving this movie. I think this is one of the better movies I've seen in 10 years or so, but I think if you're really into old movies, 50s, 60s, 70s, you really love Technicolor. If you're really into witch movies, if you're really into art house horror, if you're really into cinematography, set design, writing in general, this is a must see. This is phenomenal and everybody should watch this movie if you're into horror. I ended up giving this a 9 out of 10 and The Love Witch was absolutely fantastic. The next movie I saw was The Black Phone. I had heard a lot of hype about in 2022, but it's not something I got around to. I was actually pleasantly surprised by this. I had kind of low expectations going into it, but I had heard from several people I respect on other podcasts that they really enjoyed it and this was actually worth watching. And I'm really glad I actually got a chance to watch this because this absolutely blew the expectations I had for it out of the water completely. Ethan Hawke does an amazing job playing a psychopath and I think he's a little bit underrated. He's one of those guys you don't hear from much anymore. At least I don't in the world that I'm usually involved with, like horror movies and stuff like that. So I wasn't really too sure what to expect from Ethan Hawke playing a psychopath like this, but he was fantastic. I was also kind of surprised that they made a movie like this in 2022. This feels like something that easily could have been made in the 70s and would have been right at home, both in the idea and in the execution. The cinematography is awesome. The lighting is great. The script is fantastic. The color grading can be a little bit distracting at times, but I think that's just for the them to try to really drive home the point that this is the 70s. But outside of the color grade, it works really, really well. I love the idea that the kid is communicating with past victims and really kind of succeeding because of everybody else's anger and leftover resentment towards this guy that did horrible things to them. And I was just overall really surprised at how much I ended up liking the Black Phone. And I ended up giving this an eight out of 10. If you have not seen the Black Phone yet, it's totally worth it. And it blew every expectation I had out of the water. Okay, so the next movie I saw was the menu. Now we did do a podcast about this episode, so I won't go super in depth about how I feel about this. I will link that up top right now and down in the description, but just for a real quick rundown of what I thought about this, I was not very impressed. All I heard was how good the menu is and it just had so much hype behind it. And I think that may have been why I walked into this expecting more. Now, admittedly, I do feel like I definitely need to give this movie a second watch because in all honesty, I think this would probably be better a second time around, kind of knowing what's coming and being able to pick stuff up from the beginning. This is not something I resonated with nearly as much as Brett did. I thought it was pretentious and not in the way that they wanted it to be pretentious. The menu feels like somebody making a movie about yachting and going see. Aren't rich people terrible? Duh, we, we all knew that. Duh. These are all nitpick things that I had a problem with. The cinematography was great. The lighting was phenomenal. Ralph Fiennes is great. He's the standout here. He blows everybody else in this movie away and he needs to because of his character. If you want to hear more about why I didn't like this movie again, go check out the podcast. But I rated this a four out of 10. On a second watching, this will definitely go higher for me. And then the next movie I watched was 31. I think all month I've been kind of on a Rob Zombie kick. At the end of last year, I rewatched House of a Thousand Corpses, which had me just kind of wondering what the rest of Rob Zombie's movies that I have not seen or like. And I think 31 is probably one of my more favorite Rob Zombie movies. It's everything I expected from him, plus some. Doomhead, I think, is one of the greatest characters that he's ever come up with. And I love the idea of people getting picked up and thrown into this crazy game that they have no choice but to take part in. It's really scary at some points. I love all of the characters that he's written into this. Rob Zombie is not typically great at writing very good dialogue, but he is amazing at getting atmosphere and 
intention out of his films. And that is the thing I think that I expect from him when I do go to watch a new Rob Zombie movie. Generally speaking, I think he's at his best when he does stuff like this, where he just sets up crazy circumstances and lets crazy characters wander through interacting with other crazy characters. And 31 is exactly that. Overall, I actually really enjoyed 31 far more than I thought it would. It's slightly above average. And if you haven't seen it, it's it's a lot of fun. I ended up rating this as six out of 10. Next up, I watched Kill Bill Volume 1. I did not get around to watching Kill Bill Volume 2 yet, but this was obviously a rewatch for me. After the whole Rob Zombie thing, I started thinking about Tarantino and how good he is at writing dialogue. It's full of action. It's full of fantastic dialogue. The setups are amazing. The payoffs are even better. And honestly, I think this is my second favorite Tarantino movie. It's got everything that he's good at, and he's just a complete master at what he does. So I ended up rating this a 9 out of 10. The next thing I watched was Glass Onion, A Knives Out Mystery. This is a film that had a ton of hype. It felt like the entire world was talking about this movie back when I watched it several weeks ago. Honestly, I had not seen the first Knives Out, so I wasn't really too sure what to expect. I knew that it was a mystery-esque sort of a thing, but I didn't really know too much going into this other than I really, really like Edward Norton. And then you go and you add Daniel Craig and Dave Bautista and Kate Hudson and a bunch of other people. Glass Onion is fantastic. And the less you know going into it, I think the better. It's shot really well. The script is really smart and fun. And I had a ton of fun trying to figure out who was doing what. Daniel Craig is phenomenal. Ed Norton is great. Dave Bautista is even pretty good in this. And even though I felt like it was kind of predictable, I didn't have any less fun because of it. If you haven't seen this yet, I highly suggest this. Glass Onion is a ton of fun. And I'm actually looking forward to the next movie in the series, Knives Out. So I went ahead and rated this one an eight out of 10. So the next one that I watched, again, I'm, I'm on kind of a Tarantino thing here. The Hateful Eight. They had the episodic extended director's cut on Netflix. And I watched this whole thing within four episodes, but I did it all in one sitting. I think it ended up being like over three hours or something. This is not something I had seen before. This has been on my watch list for a very long time. And because they broke it up into little sections, it just felt more digestible. I ended up really liking this. I think this is far from Quentin's best work, but it's genuinely amazing to watch that man write dialogue. Samuel Jackson is phenomenal in this. Kurt Russell is such a badass. It's one of those movies that I can't believe I hadn't seen this earlier. I've heard nothing but good things about it, but The Hateful Eight was just on my watch list for many years, and, and I've been trying to catch up on some of my watch list stuff. I went ahead and rated this an 8 out of 10. The next thing that I watched was The Pale Blue Eye. This is something that Brett did a solo review on. I will link that up top as well as down in the description. To be honest, I wasn't really too on board with this movie at the beginning, but as it unfolds, I think it gets better and better the further you go along into it. And I don't hate on anybody for not being able to get into a movie like this because it is a period piece. It's really slow. The dialogue is kind of dry, but if you can get into the whole mystery murder side of things in this, it's really entertaining. And I have to say, Harry Melling as Edgar Allan Poe is one of the greatest performances of last year, I think. It was just shocking to me to see how good he's gotten. I know he's a classically trained stage actor, so I think that's where his performance comes from. It's really, really powerful. Christian Bale's phenomenal in this, do not get me wrong, but Harry Melling steals every single scene that he is in, and damn, is that hard to do, especially when you're playing off of Christian Bale. The cinematography is phenomenal, the color grading is great, the acting is mind-blowing, and if you stick with it, there's a really phenomenal movie in here, if you're willing to look past some of the pacing issues. I ended up rating this a 9 out of 10. The next thing I watched this month was Freddy vs. Jason. I did a solo review on this one, so there's like a 12-minute video of me talking about exactly how I feel about this movie, so I won't go super in-depth with it. But as somebody who loves the Friday the 13th series, I had kept this off my watch list forever because I knew I was gonna kind of dislike it. And I really, generally speaking, have sort of a large dislike for early to mid-2000s horror movies. It's hard for me to get around it. It's at an age where I was maybe at my most pretentious. I know that's hard to believe. Pretentiousness is hereditary just because they haven't found the gene yet. So I have a really big blind spot for early to mid 2000s horror movies. And that's something I've been trying to get over, which is why I watched Freddy vs. Jason. Like I said, I did a whole solo review on this, so I won't go super in depth with it. I rated it a five out of 10. This is kind of middle of the road horror for me. Not bad, not great, five out of 10. The next one I watched, I was a little bit late too. This was Christmas Bloody Christmas. I did watch this after Christmas. It's just one of the movies that I've been meaning to get around to last month and I just didn't have time to get to. This is directed by Joe Bagos. I really love Killer Santa Claus movies. 
it's one of my favorite little subgenres of Christmas horror. And there's just something so creepy when you put Santa in the role of the killer. This is a ton of fun. There's not a lot of depth to it, but I don't think there needs to be. This is a killer Santa Claus movie. It's slightly different because Santa is an animatronic, which gives him some abilities that usual, normal, everyday killer Santas don't have. And I think Christmas Bloody Christmas is going to make it onto the list of movies that I pull out every single year. There's just something about killer Santa Claus movies that is just the best. And Christmas Bloody Christmas is probably one of the better, more recent ones. And I kind of wanted more of what Christmas Bloody Christmas gives us out of Violet Night. And so I think this came out right at the right time. I rated this a six out of 10. In retrospect, I probably could have given it a seven or an eight. I had a lot of fun with this and it is definitely, definitely worth seeing next season. The next movie I watched was Off Season. Now this is from director Mickey Keating, who made one of my favorite movies of the last 20 years, which is called Darling. And so I was really eager to see Off Season. I've seen a lot of people say that this is just sort of a Lovecraft, The Fog mashup. And I can see that, but for me, this worked really, really well. I think Mickey Keating has come a long way since Darling. And he's made some other stuff like Psychopaths that I didn't care for nearly as much, but damn, did he hit it out of the park with Off Season. I loved this film. And it's one of those movies that not everybody is gonna get, but if you stick with it and you and you keep kind of an open mind while you're watching it, it really stuck with me for days after I watched it. I think that Mickey Keating is one of the better horror directors out there right now, and he does not get enough credit for everything that he does. Off Season is so damn good. So I really highly recommend this. I gave this an eight out of 10, mostly because of the uh, pacing issues. If you can see past some of the pacing issues, you will uh, have a really good time with that one. The next movie I watched was Hatchet. This was a rewatch for me. It's just something I hadn't seen in a long time. I really like Adam Green's YouTube stuff. Unfortunately, I just don't like his directing style nearly as much as I like his YouTube shows. Hatchet is one of those things that I think is kind of a cult classic at this point. I think there's four or five of them now. And I just wanted to go back and watch the original and it's okay. I'm not sure it aged the best for a slasher, but that's the mid 2000s for you. I think that the gore is fantastic. There's just something about that era, even though that was the era that I grew up in. Revisiting it in horror is not something I particularly like, but all in all, this is actually not a bad film. I ended up rating it a six out of 10. Now, this was the movie that I was really looking forward to in January, and that was Infinity Pool. I had a lot to say about this when we did the podcast about this, which we released just a few days ago. I will link that up top here right now and down in the description. Brett and I really broke this movie down and really talked about our interpretations of what this film is about. So I won't go super in depth with that, but if you're into weird sci-fi near future psychological thriller horror films, you gotta see this. This is an art house movie through and through, so it is definitely pretentious. But if you can look past the pretentiousness, there is a phenomenal movie in here. And I think it's a really self-reflective film by Brandon Cronenberg and he hit it out of the park. A ton to interpret and I love films that sort of leave everything open for your interpretation. And this movie, it's everything that I love about film. And God damn, you gotta see it. You gotta see it. I gave this a nine out of 10. And then the very last film that I watched in January was The Lords of Salem. This is a Blu-ray that I've had sitting on my shelf for a very long time at this point. And again, I've been trying to go back and watch some of Rob Zombie's films. I think Lords of Salem is maybe my least favorite film of his, but it's also really ambitious. It's kind of painfully obvious that he wrote this movie for Sherry Moon Zombie, but did it in a way that the writers of Seinfeld made season one, where he wrote this in such a way that she's kind of surrounded by people that are really good actresses, but it doesn't necessarily work that well because she has a really hard time showing emotion and depth in her acting. And she's really good at playing a psychopath, but she's not good at showing emotion, which is what most of acting is. I didn't believe her in this film for one second, which really dragged the whole thing down. I also mentioned before, I think Rob Zombie is terrible at writing dialogue. So some of the dialogue in this movie is downright cringeworthy. All in all, this film is really ambitious and I really respect Rob Zombie for going out of his comfort zone and trying to write what I would describe as a more traditional horror movie. Once we do start getting toward the end, we do start heading more into Rob Zombie's territory with awesome horror sh coming out of every pore, but it takes a little bit too long to get there. And Sherry Moon doesn't help it get there at all, in my opinion. There's a ton of other people that are in this that are really good. Ken Faree is a good example, but it just kind of was a drag for me, other than the fact that the idea is dope. And if there's one thing that Rob Zombie is good at, it's building tension. There's a lot of that stuff in here, so it's not all bad. And I ended up rating this a six out of 10. I actually did enjoy watching this. It's a fun movie, despite me having my issues 
issues with the lead actress. So let me know what you guys thought about this video. This is something that I have never done before, so I wasn't really too sure how to go about doing it. What have you been watching this month? I'm really interested to see what everybody else has been watching. I've already got several films under my belt for February, and I know that we're gonna be doing one of these at the end of February here, so I'll be slightly more prepared to put it out on time, hopefully. But I really enjoy talking about movies, and this is a good way for me to just brain dump everything that I've been kind of watching over the last month and just give you small little pieces of what I thought about it. So if you like this, make sure you hit the like button. If you really liked it, make sure you hit the subscribe button because we get a lot more content like this on this channel. Thank you guys for watching and I will see you guys next time from the deep. Bye bye.